say in the introduction to team with a rhetoric question, if a Europe is really like a land of dreams, or is this like a consequence of the centuries of defining itself as most civilized and on the other hand running this uh, uh, politics of uh, conquests everywhere, inside and outside of the borders, uh, and which uh, finally ended in performing geopolitical unity of different countries. Uh, whatever the answer might be, in the current situation in global four, it is quite um, the fact that it is much easier to travel outside the borders of Europe than for, uh, for the people to have inside uh, in, uh, to the Europe. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is very difficult to pass this border if people are coming from outside. Not always, that's uh, true. But a lot of times migrants, especially undocumented uh, migrants or asylum seekers, uh, face difficult traveling, legal issues, uh, uh, bureaucratic problems, absence of healthcare, uh, non suitable life situation uh, in migrant refugee places, and uh, consequently they don't have the uh, ability to find a work in a legal way. Uh, but besides the process of victimization, there is also uh, a growing process of empowerment, uh, which can be seen in the protests of migrants that recently started. So, uh, on this round table, uh, uh, Anina, uh, activist from Frankfurt, will uh, show us the insight in the situation, mostly in German, in context of uh, European Union, and then uh, Irinka Cibret Milovanc, she is a student of the Department of Ecology and Anthropology and she also studies homeopathy. Uh, we'll have some questions and later on uh, Ush, uh, Professor Dr. Ursula Rikovic Cibron uh, will, will show us her insights and work on this issue. Uh, I would like to uh, show this short movie at the beginning which will um, enlighten us the particular situation of migrant uh, asylum seekers situation in the world. This particular person is coming from Malta and he will tell us the problems he was facing all the time and the, the background of so these problems. Parce que vous voyez, c'est la crise de la guerre froide. Moi d'ailleurs, j'arrivais à aller à, à, à Libye. J'étais là-bas à Libye, j'avais travaillé. Et lorsque j'ai commencé à aller à Libye, donc je n'ai pas tourné chez moi. Parce que j'étais chez moi aussi, il y a beaucoup de problèmes là-bas. Donc à Libye, j'étais à Libye, j'avais en Italie, à Lépédouza. Voilà, le Pérouse aussi, je suis arrivé à le Pérouse, après le Pérouse en Italie. Mais le Pérouse aussi, quand on arrive à le Pérouse, il y a des gens qui sont morts dans tout le bâton. Parce que nous sommes au nombre de 500 personnes. Mais il y a 7 personnes qui sont toujours là, malgré, qui sont toujours là, malgré, dans notre bâton. Donc, quand j'ai arrivé en Italie, j'étais en Italie, j'ai fait un et sept mois. Parce qu'on avait une affaire de la demande des de papiers, parce qu'ils ont dit que nous ne sommes pas refusés international, ils ont dit que nous sommes des négatifs. J'ai dit, on a nous sommes beaucoup de gens qui, sont, qui viennent de Mali, qui viennent de Niger, Nigeria, Burkina, et puis il y a beaucoup aussi qui sont un peu, qui sont un peu en fait, parce qu'ils sont tournés en Afrique même. Bon, moi j'ai resté avec un ami, quoi, on a resté ensemble, on a pris un euh, avocat. 2012, c'était moi 2012, et j'ai reçu mon papier de trois ans en Italie. En entrée de 2013, le janvier, on s'est dit qu'on a, 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 a parti, on a cherché pour aller dans des pays d'Europe, par exemple France, en Allemagne, pour chercher des travail, parce que le gouvernement italien ne s'ouvre pas de travail pour nous voir. Et le gouvernement qui nous a demandé le monde qu'à aller, en France, en Allemagne. C'est nous qui sommes proposés de ce pays. On n'a qu'à aller en France, on n'a pas pu aller chercher le travail là-bas. 
Parce que je dis que les gens qui sont là-bas, c'était un dernier. Ici, c'était un dernier. C'était un dernier à l'Italie, quoi. Le papier que l'Italie a donné, on pense que ça ne travaille pas en Europe. Ici, en Allemagne, en France, on sait que dans aucun pays d'Europe, on ne travaille pas. Donc, on veut rester en Italie pour chercher le travail, mais les choses étaient difficiles, quoi. Euh, le fait de février, on a calculé le février, le deuxième mois, le euh, deuxième jour de mars, donc on a calculé tous les appartements, toutes les, les compos en Italie, tous les refusés qui sont, qui sont évoqués en Italie, qui sont passés, comme on dit, qui sont euh, été là, comme le gouvernement a donné euh, les tout le monde n'est pas sorti. Les gens qui sont ici, c'est 5 euros, les autres qui sont ici, 4 euros, les autres qui sont ici aussi. 600, 700, jusqu'à 800 euros, quoi. Mais où j'étais au moins, j'ai resté quand même 500 euros, ce que j'ai resté, quoi. 500 euros que j'ai resté, le gouvernement m'a demandé, je n'ai pas allé où je voulais, j'ai dit que ça, ça ne se passe pas, sous exemple, pour moi, moi, je veux rester à l'église, ici, prendre une maison pour chercher le travail. Et dit qu'ils ne sont pas, ils n'ont rien à voir avec moi maintenant, ils sont dit que c'est fini. Le contrat est fini, maintenant je n'ai pas les. Et même nous, les gouvernements de l'Italie, même qui sont en face, ce n'est pas les, les choses, les gouvernements qui sont. Ils sont. Nous sommes de voir une, une, une chose de politique là pour les airs, quoi. Parce qu'on dit que ce n'est pas pour te bénéficier les argent, les maisons pour habiter. Et puis, tu te rends compte de la police, on te dit que maintenant, qu'est-ce que tu fais ici Les policiers, ils t'arrivent, ils te disent qu'est-ce que tu fais ici Ils te disent que tu. Mais je dis, je suis ici, je cherche la maison pour habiter, on te dit que non, il n'y a pas de maison pour habiter. Il faut soit qu'il aller en France ou qu'il faut aller en Allemagne. Et une nuit que on m'a ajouté de voir le nuit, qu'on m'a ajouté de voir quoi C'était une nuit de. C'était le vendredi quoi Le vendredi, nuit, où j'étais déjà chez pour ce que j'ai je n'ai même pas trouvé. Le policier m'a arrêté pour me dire qu'est-ce que j'étais déjà chez Il dit que j'ai cherché un poste pour dormir quoi On m'a dit que j'étais où là Il expliquait que j'étais dans mon comité, j'étais à Vitarma, j'habite à Fédré. Elle fait très profit, j'ai dit, mais non, elle est venue de venir et tout. On m'a dit, maintenant, je n'ai qu'à quitter chez elle, maintenant, c'est fini, parce que je n'ai qu'à aller jusqu'à la Sicilia, quoi. Maintenant, elle va aller faire chaud un peu, quoi. Il dit que ça, c'est juste ce parlant de faire chaud. On m'a dit que vous ne pouvez pas quitter le mien en dehors, quoi. Il dit que vous ne pouvez pas quitter le policier, vous ne pouvez pas venir ce parlant là, quoi. On m'a dit, si on peut dire, parce que maintenant, c'est fini, les choses, les contrats, c'est fini, maintenant, c'est fini. On dit que c'est fini, c'est fini. On n'a qu'à aller. Tout ce que vous m'avez déjà chez nous ici. Le policier m'a dit ça. Il dit que vous êtes la police. On m'a dit, ouais, bien, c'est nous sommes la police. Il dit que vous devez me aider, quoi. Pour me trouver un poste pour dormir cette nuit, quoi. On m'a dit que si, bien, c'est mais on ne peut pas faire ça pour toi. C'est fini. Le contrat est fini, c'est fini. Il dit que quand on vous dit que je n'ai pas à Sicilia, quoi, qu'est-ce que ça se fait pour nous Je n'ai pas à Sicilia. À Sicilia. On m'a dit comme là-bas, c'est un peu chaud, quoi. Tu peux essayer de dormir en dehors, quoi. Il dit qu'il m'a assez beaucoup mieux pour vous. Il dit qu'il m'a assez beaucoup mieux pour vous. Il dit qu'il m'a assez beaucoup mieux pour vous. C'est à propos de Lampedusa, en Allemagne. C'est parce que nombreuses personnes, bien sûr, fuient de la Libye, parce que la guerre de l'Ontario et aussi avant. And many of them, of course, as he said, uh, because of, um, of boats and tra um, the problem with, with, with the sea and the Italian police, that um, uh, in many ways um, nearly helped them, uh, they, were, they were having many, many problems uh, in arriving there. But when they arrived, because uh, EU was funding, um, was giving, uh, Italy was giving EU funds because of the war, NATO war in Libya, they, they could uh, get the permission to stay. And when these funds were over, they practically um, denied the possibility that all these refugees would have the possibility to stay in Italy. And as he said, that, that's uh, totally true because many of the refugees, many of the refugees who were granted refugee sta status as asylum seekers and then um, with refugee status already uh, obtained, were forced to leave Italy uh, and, um, and they were traveling, they were uh, get the permission to travel inside Schengen area. So, this is completely illegal, because Italy, Italy was saying, go and travel, go and find yourself 
you know, new home and new job. Um, because what is uh, the European uh, European laws um, would the Dublin Convention and other would always say uh, the the state who accepts the refugee is responsible for for him or her. So um, not only accepted, but where the refugee put his food exactly. for the first time in exactly. the Schengen area. Thank you. Yes. And in this sense, um, especially Austria and Germany are um, many people came from Italy to Germany and Austria, and they are without possibility to, to have a job, uh, to, to seek an employment, legal, or uh, to get healthcare or something like that. And uh, Germany, what I know, I don't know, maybe Anina uh, would correct me, uh, Germany is saying that it's not responsible for these migrants. And, um, but you need to know that Germany uh, was involved in the war uh, with uh, NATO war with uh, India. So it's a very messy situation and a very uh, full of contradictions. So I don't know what to Okay. Okay. I will talk almost about the um, system of asylum in Germany. And there's a documentary about this, which is called The Truth Lies in Rostock. It is on YouTube. And they have interviewed the police about this. And um, they, there were a lot of randoms that could not really be random. Like every, on these three days, every responsible policeman was not there. And the thing to throw water against demonstrators was not there. Then uh, on the second day, maybe there came a lot of anti-fascist activists to this place, and then the police, instead of uh, caring about what the fascists were doing there, because they already started to put fire, they arrested a lot of um, anti-fascist people. And uh, they have interviewed also one uh, uh, important policeman there, and he said, yeah, on this side we didn't see a reason to intervene, and you just see him and think, a uh, nice haircut, like this. And this uh, Hitler haircut and so uh, what happened there, there has had been a campaign of the, uh, in the end the building was burning and it was like a, a miracle that nobody has died in this and before there had been a campaign of a fascist Nazi party called Republicana with the slogan the boat is full and they voted around everywhere like Germany is a boat and a few people are sitting in and all these refugees are trying to come in and we have to stop this. But unbelievably um, the other parties, political parties, just jumped on the same train and you could hear sentences like, yeah, um, Germany is not ready for this and then they took really this unbelievable conclusion that one has to accommodate the Nazis' opinion and stop immigration. And what happened then was 1993 that um, the asylum law was totally changed and three main changes made um, it to the point that the human right on asylum was de facto abolished in Germany. The three main changes were for the first uh, the procedure itself that completely was changed like um, practically you can say that the persons have a very short time in which they have to give a perfect um, description of what happened to them and also a perfect description of the, the situation in their home country. And if anything it doesn't seem very right, they, it's already said that you are lying. Um, the second thing is this um, yeah, concept of secure third countries. Like some countries are considered secure enough to stay there and if on their way to Germany they have been in such a state, like for example Turkey, they are deported to this state. And the third thing was what we have now talked about, Dublin II, that they have to apply for asylum in the first European state where they put their food. And um, in fact, all this, uh, many of these European laws have been actually prepared in Germany and brought into the European Parliament by Germany and this is how the rich inner countries um, protect themselves and the refugees are stuck at the outside border and uh, it's also one of the things that has been reported by uh, the NGO Pro Asyl is that what happens now is a chain deportation like um, let me see 
Yeah. Germany deports to Hungary. By the way, um, the inner European uh, deportations, because of this Dublin II law, made like two thirds of all deportations actually. Germany deports to Hungary. Hungary considers Serbia as a secure state. Serbia deports to Turkey. And Turkey deports directly to countries like Iran and Iraq. And so by the Dublin II law, the people are little by little deported until their country of origin. And there's this horrible situation in the outside borders like Greece, Malta, Italy, Hungary, where they are um, systematically directly put in prison. They give them uh, pharmaceutical, uh, like um, psychopharmaceutical, and there are 150 people staying, like really in one room in a way that not all people can lie at the same time, but some have already stay, some have to lie. The toilet is spoiling, spilling over, it flows into the mattresses, also children are amongst them and all that. But, so Germany just washes itself like this. Okay, the procedure of um, applying for asylum. So when uh, people arrive, they have to do the application for asylum in an alien's department and um, they are accommodated in a so-called first accommodation establishment or Erstaufnahmeeinrichtung up to three months. Uh, the refugees are distributed on these first accommodation establishments um, of the districts upon a rail system. They get pocket money and provisions and have a restricted access to healthcare. Um, they cannot go everywhere in Germany because there's this asylum seeker residence law, which uh, says that they have they are not supposed to leave the district where they are. And sometimes um, the administration is free to say uh, to reduce it even more, like to the city and all this. And what is interesting in this, for example, is that when they in our newspapers they write. Uh, Immigrants are very uh, criminal. They um, have not um, corrected the statistic by the fact that for um, refugees it is much easier to be criminal. Like when you leave your city, you uh, you are criminal. It is illegal. It's just uh, this is never clarified when it's written in the newspapers or in the police statistics that migrants are more criminal than Germans. No working permission. Because of the asylum seeker benefit law, it's a racist law that um, I will explain later more about this. Like they don't get the same money like as Germans who are without work and all this. The legal status is um, residence title for a specific purpose. And this time it's important that they get in contact with NGOs who have them. I only have the numbers of 2010, I'm sorry. But 2010, uh, there were 41,332 first applications. Then comes the interview, the first hearing. It is led by an official in charge of the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees. And what's interesting is that the catalogue of questions mainly cope deal with the escape way, not with the causes. Of escaping, like they, they were rather interesting in knowing where people go and how we can protect the borders even better. Um, crucial is not the content, but the credibility. An advocate, as well as one other person of confidence, can be present. This hearing is decisive for the whole procedure for granting asylum. And this is actually what the people don't know. They just you know, think, ah, now I can tell what's the problem, and they don't. So we need to take care of what they're telling, but this is the thing on which will be decided. And there is sometimes, for example, a problem with uh, translators, like people uh, translate wrongly, and because of the wrong translation, uh, something is uh, like a uh, contradiction, and then they say you have lied, uh, and yeah. And also, for a long time, it has not been taken into consideration that women who have been violated cannot talk to this for at least four weeks, uh, at least uh, not to a man. It was like maybe 2007 that they made a law for this also, to take this into consideration. 
but people nevertheless are traumatized. So then comes the transfer into a commune, like into a city, and uh, the refugees are looking forward to this, and you can often hear sentences like, hey, tomorrow or next week, uh, transfer into the commune, and they're, like, they think that now their life in Germany starts, and they have really no idea what is there awaiting for them. I'm sorry, uh, after three months, right? Mm -hmm. And they are transferred? Yeah, all of them. Sometimes earlier, but after three months is the latest. So, there, they are then waiting for the decision on the application and the legal status is still the same. It's called Aufenthaltsgestattung. What was it again in English? The resident decided for specific purpose. The legal basis is the Asylum Seeker Benefit Law. It's called the German Asylbewerberleistungsgesetz and there is a lot of stuff in it and the protests which have arose uh, in Germany since last year mainly cooperate with this Asylbewerberleistungsgesetz It's uh, valid for all refugees that don't had, have not got any right to stay yet. I will tell you later, there are three different possibilities to get a right to stay, like the Tyrannites. But if they are refused, or if they are still waiting for the answer, which can take many years, they, this law is for them. And it means that they cannot live in a normal flat, but are accommodated in a camp. The city in which they live can decide that the people will live in a, in a normal flat, but in most of cases it's they stay in the camp. And what is uh, really ironic is that these camps are privatized, and also a lot of this um, what the uh, the state should do for the people, like camping, legal stuff, or it's also privatized, and they. These uh, companies actually win a lot of money with this and these accommodations cost to the state more money than if all these persons would get normal flats. And the uh, people who work there are very often acting in a racist way. I cannot say why, if they are like this, or maybe for they get a lot of pressure, but they are very often acting in a very racist way. We have often tried to visit the people there and uh, directly the person comes and who are you, what do you want here, I want to visit someone. Me, you cannot visit somebody, um, you have to ask a permission to visit the people and uh, everything you ask to them and they reply to you, they show them that for them it's, it's obvious that something with these people is uh, basically different than the Germans, so that you must control them because they are different. That's what you always feel then, and instead of helping them, it's everyday discrimination. You want to get a letter, no, you cannot get it, you have not done this and this. And many of these residents, especially in Bavaria and Eastern Germany, they don't even have the right to go out without telling that they go out, and they cannot get their emails for themselves, but they have to ask it, the administration. I will tell later a bit more about these camps. So, now this is also from 2010. It has been augmented a bit. I don't know actually much. They got per month 40 euros pocket money and 184 euros for um, food, hygiene, clothes and electricity. Now, it's again that um, they uh, city can decide if they get money or if they get the benefit in kind, like non-cash things, like they directly get the clothes or they get bon coupons for uh, supermarkets, uh, not money. And this is also a thing, or sometimes they just get food in this camp every day and there's often uh, food with a middle and, or which has perimated like the very bad stuff and there has been a study conducted by doctors uh, which has, I don't know, maybe 60 pages, I remember right, 
and which really um, concludes on all levels that this life will lead to sickness mentally and um, physically because uh, they also with the money they get it's like it was like 67 percent of what German unemployed people get and compared to children of German unemployed people it's not even the fourth part of it so um, the German the law for German unemployed people has already been uh, declared to be unconstitutional and uh, the asylum seekers get like half of this what is already been declared unconstitutional so it's impossible to live if you don't work illegally what most people then do there's also um, there was a guy who traveled to go all around Germany and sang everywhere in front of these uh, camps or lagers and he is told of one young guy who went to a nearby uh, shop and took a stone and threw it into the um, vitrine because he thought that imprisonment would be better than in the camp. Um, yeah, they still have this.
10 in Jena. And there they wrote a pamphlet. And since it's very often happened that um, German activists or NGOs try to tell the refugees how they have to express themselves and often criticize that they express it in very bad or not suitable words. And they have very often complained about it. I find it also important to cite their own words about it. So. In some cases, what is not considered good enough for their dogs are considered the best food for us, while at the same time they make it illegal for us to cook our own food. Not to mention the food packets with the expired dates on them. In fact, in many cases, the feeding system is used as a method to control our presence in the lager, lager is camp, and a way to separate the good and obedient refugees from the bad and rebellious ones who have yet to learn to accept the rule of continued colonial power. On the basis of such rebellion, we are considered unfit to live in this society, while those considered good and obedient are told they have no right to stay here as they are not really useful. For they believe that if we do not rot at the bottom of the ocean, then we should certainly rot in their isolated and abandoned military barracks located in the forests, away from regular human beings at any urban centers. It is easier to control and slowly destroy us that way and out of sight of any prying public or media. This lager and control mentality that underlies the asylum system in Germany has a long, dubious and brutal history with far-reaching consequences. From the general to the specific, the strategy is to isolate, stigmatize and then persecute. From the various notorious lagers under the National Socialists through the lagers for guest workers, the lager and control mentality has been a consistent and perverse feature of the German system in dealing with those that are either considered not directly useful or those that are outrightly unwanted. It should be recalled that in the erstwhile DDR many contract or guest workers were also similarly kept in hind and even couples amongst them were separated to ensure that they did not raise families. The story is told of some women guest workers who were sent home because they were pregnant and refused to abort the pregnancy. The rule was that you were either here to work as demanded or required by the state, or you were out of fear to ensure that not even family issues were to obstruct that requirement. You are either useful for our economy or you are out. Through all these phases, the lager and control mentality is sustained. And what is not this control mentality? was it not this control mentality that was also evident in the Nazi requirement of foreigners to obtain permission to ha even have children. Interestingly, disturbing to note how deep and ingrained the control mentality is in Germany. So little attitudinal changes in the many years that have gone by. But why is that? Good question. It may not have been necessary beyond academic inquiry to revisit this question now, if many of us are not currently reliving the harsh realities and the bitter consequences of this mentality and its attendant system. When the darkest and bloodiest history of this country was forcefully prevailed upon the mid-40s, the so-called allied were determined to set up a system different from the one they just defeated. But the new system was set up perfectly to accommodate and rehabilitate majority of this traumatized personnel in the very regime they just defeated, blurring over all this with the Nuremberg trials. So the rehabilitation and continued presence of highly placed people under the National Socialists in basically all fields of behavior also meant that their culprits settled more comfortably into the new political system with their cohorts, the easier it became for them to relapse nearer into their old flame of mind. We should remember here that we are talking of the lager and control mentality. And nowhere in the Western world is this more demonstrated than in Germany. History records that restriction of movement placed on Jews and other foreigners in 1938, like in the Nazi regime, and the consequent fine for violation of that restriction. While word portrait and condemnation have since been rightly heaped on this and the more horrible crimes of this era, since 1982, this obnoxious restriction has been replicated on all asylum seekers throughout this country in the form of the so-called residentpflicht. That for a refugee to live his or her immediate district, she or he needs a written permission from the foreigner's office, else a fine or possible jail term awaits upon police control 
is a startling reminder of that 1938 restriction. Now, what does it cost Germany, culturally or economically, if refugees or asylum seekers can move freely within a country like normal human beings? Nothing, absolutely nothing. But it is the la German lager and control mentality that is at play here. Just to clarify this with one more example. Many studies by independent investigators have shown that it is much cheaper if refugees are accommodated in private housing. And even different governmental sources have acknowledged this. But the authorities balk at this cost-effective measure and rather continue to take pride in maintaining the humiliating lager system that defies human dignity and denies privacy to refugees. The same is true of food coupons in the Gutscheine. It costs the government more than the value of the Gutscheine that is actually paid out. And with all the unwanted attention, humiliation and the problems associated with Gutscheine, one wonders why the authorities insist on using Gutscheine and not cash, which is cheaper, easier and better for all. It has to do with the lager and control mentality. In cross with old habits, they die hard at the same. In most of cases, refugees get a refusal and then uh, demand not to leave the country in between four weeks or sometimes even one week. Against this decision, one can assume, bring it on trial. The difficulty is the financing of an advocate and their contacts to NGOs. Uh, the court case is the same problem with translators who expressly wrongly translate and then they are implied to have lied. The judge verifies if an uh, obstacle to deportation is there, like medical reasons, prosecution in the country of origin, endangering of children's wealth. If the statements on trial are in contradiction to those in the first interview, one imputes to the refugee to lie, like when the translator, for example, has not been translated or uh, they have something, say something wrong because of drama, trauma, and they didn't really know that this is important, what they actually say. I again have only numbers from 2010, but which is actually, I think, not a problem because uh, I think the numbers might have decreased because uh, the European uh, border control is getting better and better, so less and less refugee make it to Germany. So in 2010, the recognition as having a right of asylum was 1.3%. Um, so this is the highest thing you can get, and it's 1.3%. The recognition as a refugee, 14.7%, which means that you have a residence permit for three years and working permission at healthcare. Then there's the one third thing, it's recognition of security against deportation, which 5.6% get, and it means a, a residence permit for one year and restrict, restricted social rights. So the whole rest, like 56.6%, got this refusal with demand note of outward voyage. And uh, I know, for example, in 2004, there was not even 4% who got the status of a refugee. And what comes then is Duldung. Duldung is exceptional leave to remain. And it means that you are normally, you should be deported, but there is an obstacle to deportation. This obstacle can be a legal one, like um, there is somebody sick in the family, or you are sick, or a um, practical one, like there's no flight to this country, or the other country doesn't give a passport. And uh, as soon as this obstacle is not there anymore, people should be deported. The thing is that this can take 10 or 20 years, and it often takes, and the children don't learn the, even the language of the country of origin, neither the scripture and um, they don't have to write to know when this obstacle is not there anymore so and not even their lawyer not even their advocate has to write to know it in advance because they fear that people would disappear then so therefore the deportation 
which can happen then after 10 years or 20 years, all of a sudden there are two different scenarios. The one is that they go to the administration to prolongate their duldung and sometimes they are asked to come again every day, every day to come to the administration to ask if their duldung can still be prolongated. And then they say no and then they are directly brought to the airport. Or the police comes uh, in the early morning, knocks or breaks the door and then they have uh, 30 minutes to pack, everybody can take 20 kilos and then they directly go to the airport. And if then one of the family members is not there, they uh, make a divorce and separate the family. And this has often happened that families were separated by um, deportation. So, just one more thing about deportations. We once watched a film uh, which is called Deportation in the Early Morning and there were NGO people sitting there who are um, uh, specialists in law and who help people. And there were so many cases like uh, they are deported in spite of the fact that they are sick or a family member is sick and will die soon and has nobody else to help or um, out of prison of deportation are very often happening illegal deportations like they, there's still one legal step to do, something to prove, uh, but to inquire, but they just deport like this before this can even happen. Um, I asked them, one of the specialists, so have they shown in this film some special cases? And then she said, no, this, this is what we see, what we see here every day. And there was, for example, one man lying in front of the administration, uh, like this. And um, then they started to shout at him and say, no, you cannot get what you want because of this and this. And then uh, the people from an NGO came and they said afterwards, um, what has happened there does not astonish me at all. It's always astonishing me that these heart attacks do not happen every day because these people live under constant fear and like in every family we know at least one who has got such a heart, something with heart or severe sickness because of this constant fear. I think that was the most important for an overview. Or just uh, one more citation about Bildung. The permanent asylum life suspends, no work, no studies, no right to move beyond your local district, no advancement in life, only stagnation and slow but steady waste of life. Just eat and sleep, eat and sleep until the perversity of their cruelty destroys you, enters into your brain like a tumor destroying your will to live and thus your will to fight back. Like those drugged up in mental hospitals, they attempt to put us into a vegetative state until we are either deported or if we have enough will left in our souls, go back to our countries voluntarily. So again, ARI is the anti-racist initiative of Berlin and they have collected information about refugees that have been killed or injured since 93. They collect them only from individual people or organizations who are in contact with them. So the real numbers must be much higher because they don't get any information from police or from administration. And they publish it like, I don't know, or three or four years. And also give a summary and the summary can also be downloaded from their own page, Antirassistische Initiative Berlin. So, from 93 to 2012, 170 refugees killed themselves in the face of their deportation or died trying to escape from deportation, 64 of them while in custody pending deportation. 1071 refugees injured themselves out of fear of deportation in protest against the impending deportation like risk hunger strikes or tried to commit suicide. 610 of them in custody pending deportation. Five refugees died during deportation and 417 refugees were injured by compulsory measures or mistreatment during their deportation. 32 refugees died in their country of origin after deportation and 562 
refugees were mistreated and tortured by the police or military in their country of origin or were at the risk of their lives due to severe illnesses. 71 refugees disappeared without a trace after deportation. 182 refugees died on their way to the Federal Republic of Germany or at its borders. 131 of them at the eastern border. 533 suffered injuries crossing the borders, 303 of them at the eastern border. 12 refugees died through police action independent from deportation. 15 died through neglected assistance. 455 were injured by the police or custody staff, 138 during arrest. 70 people were killed in fires, attacks on accommodation centers or dangerous in these centers. 873 refugees were injured in part severely and 18 refugees died through racist attacks on the street among them 825, no, 825 were generally injured. Um, yeah, which is interesting for me also is that the police started to hang out at the train stations, things uh, like, uh, you know, in the Wild West, these wanted uh, uh, things, and it's always about foreigners, you know, and sometimes things that are really ridiculous, like uh, a German doctor has been attacked there on the street by somebody who has a beard and whose uh, language sounded like uh, having a foreign ac uh, foreign foreign accent and this thing was it's always pointed out, always something or with an accent and sometimes just put to some facts behind the, besides this to, to to show how ridiculous this is like how, how often um, immigrants are, are injured in Germany Yes um, and uh, you have also shared with me that um, a part of your um, engagement in the theme of uh, refugee work uh, is directly empowering, um, empowering them to, um, to accommodate for themselves, um, to accommodate themselves as best as they can. And uh, part of this uh, has to do with education uh, with children. And um, I would like to, I would like to ask you. Um, from this, uh, from your personal point of view, um, well, we have all heard now that um, uh, how how the effects um, of this uh, severe maltreatment can manifest in many ways, uh, physically or mentally. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you um, about your experience with uh, the children who are coming from families um, that have gone through um, through all these stresses and maltreatment. Mm -hmm. A very astonishing thing is that people always have this this will to live and still have uh, have this very big um, joy to live also. And sometimes when I visit, for example, a friend who is Roman, she tells all the time like very horrible stories about what she has lived in Serbia and what she's living now. And then after half an hour, she starts laughing and. It, she does it so well that I also start laughing and I always go out there with a very good feeling and a joy, joy of life. But um, on the other hand, I, I gave a private lesson to children and I always saw that in the first months they were still very courageous and we would face everything and like in their countries the, everything's not so ordered and like chaotically you can can manage everything and then little by little they get adopted to the system you have to do like exactly it is prescribed and also lose a bit of their um, of their will and I was for example with the Afghan family and the eldest daughter she's the one who can maybe soon earn money and she stresses a lot at school and she doesn't want to allow her to, for example, repeat a class because she wants to go to earn money as soon as possible and yet I didn't really tell her how difficult this will be for her 
as a Muslim, and um, she, sometimes in this family it happens that everybody just cries, and then she's sitting in a separate room and does like this, and uh, I always told her, please don't stress so much for school, it's so normal that you cannot do it, since you are only two years in Germany, and the teachers sometimes is away from her, the same like from all the others. And uh, she said, now I want to do it. And then I say, but see how you are now, and which state you are now. And she says, no, that's not because of school. Yeah, it's also because of school, but uh, my head is broken almost because of my family. We have so many problems. And that's also like when you see uh, that they finally try to suicide, but they have crossed the Mediterranean sometimes on a very small boat, and that they had a strong will to live. In all these difficulties, and even in the Greece, in these camps where, where it's stinking and they get sick, and they still uh, continued to go and search for human dignity, dignity. And we in Germany, we managed to destroy their their real to life. Persons 
would be um, can can be punishable by fine or imprisonment. So that means that um, all people, from taxi drivers to clerks to uh, landlords or uh, or doctors, physicians, can be held liable if they assist um, these undocumented migrants. And what is incredible, if you think, you were telling us about how Germany, German, uh, Germany migration laws and uh, migrant policies were criminalizing uh, migrants. But at the same time, all the people who are assisting them are criminalized. So it's incredible, you know, whole society is historic apart uh, if you try to uh, help them. And uh, yeah, for me, it's quite astonishing this thing. And we also have, also in our uh, laws in Slovenia, we have this possibility to criminalize uh, people who would assist uh, undocumented migrants. So uh, there is only, you know, we just need somebody to um, be very, very, uh, in a way, um, ambitious and to apply this law in much broader sense. Um, this is one thing. The other is this comparison. If you think about the procedure, uh, it's quite the same because uh, in Slovenia we need to apply asylum law. Uh, we were forced to apply asylum law and asylum uh, center and to build detention center because European Union, Union forced us to do so. Uh, before it was totally different and it was quite messy, but we didn't have this, all these restrictions. And um, because of this, we have so many similarities, not because we are similar in characters. Like that. Um, so I think, look, just if we, maybe you can really uh, help me with this comparison, but um, with work. Uh, people who are asylum seekers in Slovenia cannot work um, at least first uh, first year. Uh, they can work after the first year if they don't have any negative response for their uh, uh, on their uh, question on, on their um, application. So it's very difficult that, that they would not get any negative response. Normally they get it. so on the first level or second or third. Then uh, here it is also crucial. We don't have uh, good translators. We have people who would translate just, you know, they, they, they are not, uh, they are paid by asylum home, so called, which is here nearby, and they're paid, um, they, they, they were, uh, they're working in this home for, so called home, this uh, center, let's say, uh, they were working for, for years, and they're kind of, uh, they're not, independent translators. They are very dependent on asylum center and they are trying to uh, help in these racist politics and policies and uh, this, um, you know, uh, they are trying to get rid of uh, asylum seekers as, as soon as possible. And yes, we don't have any, any consideration for people who are traumatized or violated or that. Women are completely, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 don't need, uh, you, you cannot get any special uh, treatment or whatever. Okay, then accommodation. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have, once you apply, once you um, present your asylum, um, the, 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 um, you, you demand, demand that you get asylum, uh, you get uh, automatically, uh, you, you, get, uh, you need to stay in the asylum center. So you don't have any other options. But before, my, my students in um, 2002, 2003 um, researched this incredible solution that many of asylum seekers uh, were living outside. And uh, because, but this was just temporary, and then after 2005, I think, um, Asylum Center decided all of Asylum Seekers need to be inside the center. And this Asylum Center is, yeah, from outside, you can see that it's uh, 
quite new and not so um, not so problematic uh, in the sense of architecture or, or structure, but it's very problematic in the sense of um, of system of repression and um, and people would, for example, just get imprisoned for days or months just because they will not obey certain certain laws, um, which are not uh, which are not they are just internal laws, not external. Okay, um, what else? Um, yeah, maybe if you if you are interested in some comparison or whatever, I can I can also explain later on. But um, also these injuries, people who would commit suicide or people who would try to commit suicide inside the uh, detention centers. We, we don't have any. We have just two NGOs who are working with refugees, asylum seekers, this waste of Ethiopia, and so-called pits. And um, when we were uh, acting in the network for permanent visit, visits inside or in, in, in um, connection to uh, people who are inside detention centers, we found that there were many suicides and many attempts to suicide. So um, we don't have any statistics and any very serious organization would uh, care about this. And we can, yeah. The same is true for right to uh, free movement. We don't, they don't have right to move freely because uh, they can stay outside the asylum's uh, home till uh, 10 p.m. and then need to be uh, present inside the center. They have, okay, man, I don't know if you remember, do you remember it's 10 euros per month or something, or 20 euros per month, they have uh, pocket money uh, which is not, you know, they cannot afford anything. Don't they, have, don't they have 100, 15 euros and it no. was around 200? And they lower it for. No, I don't think so. It's just uh, ever 150 euros. What, what I know, it was um, usually really, really pocket money, really, maybe 30, 40 euros, something like that. Um, yes, and the right to healthcare is one must. Really, really, it's really, really horrible because you, you, you have there a nurse who decides who is uh, able to see the doctor and who is not. Uh, the nurse who is really um, quite arrogant and racist, racist against these people. And um, the problem is, they don't, inside the asylum center, they don't see the problem, you know. You cannot have a nurse who can decide about, you know, the severity of the illness. Uh, and there are some doctors in, um, in uh, health center of Beach who are responsible for um, asylum seekers. But uh, since asylum seekers, they don't have their personal doctors. They are treated in a, as a marginalized group. So I think we are there in some way. Maybe we don't have camps and we don't have this. Um, Do you don't have camps? Okay, no, we don't have camps. Mm -hmm. We have everything is inside the Sadamu Center and we have the detention center in Yugoslavia. And this is mm -hmm. practically uh, mm -hmm. all. And what is interesting is that these centers are completely isolated from the city. Um, so we don't, actually don't know what is happening there. Unless you're uh, inside NGO. Yeah. Uh, it's almost the same, like uh, you said. Uh, maybe because of same laws, maybe. What um, is... I mean, what difference is uh, the money and the image that Germany has 
and all this um, happens totally unknown. I have uh, currently, I have traveled to Germany by bike before coming to other countries and I just stayed with the uh, normal people also, like people who are not active in the same way. And often these people are very open and open-minded and very interested to hear something that you don't read in the media. But on this topic, like blind on this eye, like when they started to talk about this, it was already that they started to talk and wanted to know everything. Although they know that I am active and that I have a lot of things to tell, but nobody asked. And I was always hearing some main statements like this, from this you also have to listen to the other side. And then they were not interested anymore. <laughs>
Well, they use the Red Brigades to develop uh, this social control and they strengthen uh, the police and all these surveillance systems and so on. And uh, well, the latest news, so to say, is this scandal with uh, the National Security Agency in the States uh, controlling all the internet communication. I mean, what we deal here, uh, it, we deal here with some kind of general system that is exercising its power on many different levels. It's so much easier, let's say, to to uh, to treat the refugees, or if you want, uh, the, the low, the lower uh, pe people that belong to lower s s status of the society. And when you do this, then you get uh, the rest of the population uh, feeling like that. First of all. These are criminals, must be something wrong. You know, there's a Chinese saying, uh, definitely it had to be something wrong with you, otherwise the government would not arrest you. So the very fact that you're arrested already develops an understanding that there's something wrong with you. So this is the system how to do. You have, uh, luckily you have the refugees, or you have uh, Roma, or you have this kind of, that kind of minorities, uh, which you put the society and in this way you in a way uh, you uh, you make people accept the fact that you that you don't respect the law as authority you know you have laws but you don't respect them I mean because you have people and groups within the society that are outside the law. So you need to respect any law when it comes to them. But in reality, this has also an after effect because then the whole society is treated in the same way. Only the people, the majority of the people, because they uh, resent these kind of uh, issues and because they think that luckily it's not done, you know, that they do not uh, protest against these things, protest in an effective way. You know, and then again, uh, it's like uh, Caritas, you know, or kind of humanitarian angels. You have NGOs to deal with this matter, so that the government, which is GEO, you know, needn't deal with these things and can go on because they said, yes, but we are very, uh, we are very open society. Look, we have NGOs. And we even support NGOs, you know, to deal with these matters and to somehow correct this social political situation. You, you know, I mean, that system is called, you know, capitalism, basically. Yeah, and it's also... It's, also it's called democracy. It's called liberalism uh, or neoliberalism, whatever. You know, so... And... Uh, what an incredible thing. Now you have this problem here, you talk about 800 people, 400 people, uh, even you can talk about 10,000 people, or if you want you can talk about half a million people, because that's how many Jewish people were, you know, in Germany during the Nazi period, you know. But what is this compared to the population? It's nothing. And especially if you, if you present these people as problematic people, Problematic, not in the sense that they had problems back home and then there is definitely a reason why they had to leave and so on. You know, but problematic because they're down there at the bottom. There must be a reason why they are down there at the bottom. Though there is no reason because the very fact they are at the bottom is already the reason to somehow, uh, to somehow uh, support, let's say, the government. And then you have to know that you have a government. Government is just general, you know, name for many, many very sophisticated systems of campaign and indoctrinating, you know, the populations and so on. I think it's logical that also capitalism might have its own, uh, like, compared to mobile, for example. I'll just uh, go back uh, <coughs> to make a short uh, uh, repeat uh, to, to the one uh, detail before. Uh, I think it, it cannot be exactly a comparison with these Agamban Muslims and I uh, don't know Adam uh, wrote about this because with the Muslims at that time in the concentration camps nobody actually 
was having uh, some some interaction with them. As I read, uh, it was uh, even difficult for for the prisoners and for the people who were patrolling to look at uh, this person in the eyes. So this is, it cannot be exactly the same with the current situation when we have uh, this ongoing protest of uh, refugees and migrants, uh, which we didn't uh, point it out. Maybe this is like a good conclusion to 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 look in the uh, run protest which are now going in Europe. They, you said that they started last year, as I recall. No, I agree. I agree with this. I only. Uh, what I wanted to stress uh, was that we should understand that this is not some kind of localized minor problem, you know, but actually it has to do something with uh, the very establishment of the government and this kind of system and the function of this system. This system needs these kind of things. They cannot go on without this. If they want to get the people on their side, they have to have this kind of situation. I think that you have pointed out very clearly that it's a two-way process yes, and that it's uh, one is looking out and the other. Yes, it's a symmetrical process, you know. These and these go together. That's it, and we are not yeah. at the same level. And this, and is, this is very important to understand. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add here, it's very, many people would, uh, are asking themselves why there are so many illegal workers? Why? Why is that so? Why all these people are uh, working illegally? You know, they are, as you said, uh, maybe something is wrong with them. They don't want to be legalized. So uh, it's really incredible to see how we are getting there, we are all getting there, to be a huge mass of illegal workers. Yes, yes. We are but that's okay. exactly what I said. So, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. It's exactly. the whole population. Fear and control yeah. and... When I was researching as I was... Legalizing yeah. and so on. When I was researching as I was, thinking, I was really stuck in their team. You know, I was all the time thinking about the other things. And I was, I was researching uh, race and I was stuck there. And I, and I just recently could see really the big picture because it's really difficult. Because you can, you can uh, uh, research uh, as I was in Germany or in Slovenia and you can get to uh, comparison, you know, these two levels. Okay. But then to see all Europe is uh, as, uh, that all Europe is, uh, all the population of Europe is population of asylum seekers and asylum, asylum as such is a myth, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, yes, of course. asylum as such existed from uh, second world, uh, the end of second world war two till 60s, 70s, now it doesn't exist, we are all after a huge illusion and this is a, a horrible idea because you can see all this machine who is, who is based on illusion because if you can see the numbers, you can see that practically nobody gets asylum. It's just an illusion. But now it's even worse than that. Look, I mean, they're just, they're taking whole countries now to turn them into that same thing, like Greece and so on. You know, I mean, it's, it's I, I, I have to excuse myself. I have to run. Keep talking, then we can move Sorry. Okay. Yeah, there's one question for you. And more interesting of uh, personal stories of people that come to an asylum to apply because I'm not so familiar with I know that this general story is war or it's bad conditions, but not all people come because of the war. Right? But what, what, are, what is there? Uh, I don't know if you talk, I know you can explain to everybody, but the, why do people go to here? Because we know that Europe isn't a promised land. They think maybe something that is a promised land. But uh, what is the, the general reason, maybe the biggest reason, because they want to live better here, but... Okay, this is what has always been said in the media, uh, they just come here because they like the air more than there, <laughs> and because of, uh, yeah, because of the social system. This is already the point where you have to make up your mind what uh, poverty means, actually, it's also a danger of life. So they don't come because uh, we are, have such a great social system, because really to escape the horror of poverty. And, uh, but because of this they will not get asylum, like asylum is meant to people who are politically pursued. And the absurd thing is also that um, they have a, um, a quick 
process at the Frankfurt airport and with this they can directly send people back with the same uh, flight, so the same plane they have come if they don't have any papers. But if you are politically uh, persecuted by your own state, how can you get valid uh, papers for traveling? And um, yeah, also this is one thing that has been, has been established in the 90s, like this process at the airport is even worse than the normal process. It's very quick and very unfair. And um, yeah, some people are really persecuted. And just from the Voice Refugee Forum, many people have been deported. Like really the people who were really politically persecuted, like one guy from Nigeria, he um, had his father uh, in the politics and his father has been killed and his sister has been killed and the house has been burned and somebody told him that he will be the next. He went to Germany and they told him that, I don't know, maybe he's lying, I don't know what was the, yeah, the thing. Then the Roman people from, uh, from the Balkan with really no chance to really live like human beings there. And there's also one thing I will write afterwards is um, there was, for example, the European the Roman movement, which are really good people. And also in Germany, uh, there's one organization, and they demand for a general right to stay for all Romans. But Romans have no chance at all, really no chance at all. The only chance for them to stay is if they go to the psychiatry and they uh, can prove that they have a, a, a post-traumatic something like this. It's one word that I always forget. <laughs> something like this. And um, this always gives the impression like how many Romans go into mental hospital and again gives the impression like Roman people nevertheless are crazy in their head. And that's also how, uh, how it's looked down on them in our, in our society. Even in Germany that has really a historical uh, responsibility for Romans since they also killed them with the Jewish together. And like, for example, Pakistan, people from Pakistan, sometimes they grow up and like there are all, there are a lot of movements and milit militias and whatever and sometimes they are religiously, I don't know, motivated. But this is a place where you can, um, you get help, where you can get to work and all this kind of stuff and sometimes people went there and then when it came out what actually they have to do at the end um, and what this organization is all about then they fled and uh, sometimes um, people are deported for the same reasons they have come like first they were granted asylum since they were afraid of this militia that they were a part of it but then they got afraid when they knew what it's really about and, uh, there, was, uh, there were some cases like overnight decision of the ministry. Oh, he has been with this terror organization and sent him back because they have come new laws about terrorism and foreigners, and this also um, permitted to deport a lot of people. And sometimes there are family stories like a girl was forced to marry, and very, very different. Maybe it would be great to just to know, you know, how to participate in this, how to spread voice about uh, information about the protests in uh, in Berlin. Uh, Actually, it's, it's um, European wide already. It's the second thing we will rise, and this was one when one Iranian refugee died last year in March, and then they started to go to the city center. And to hunger strike, and some even closed their lips with I don't know, needle. And when nothing changed, they started a protest march through Germany. It was in September. There were like 150 people who crossed Germany by foot. And then uh, they ended in Berlin, and that's what we have seen at the beginning. They had a protest camp all over the winter over there. And now again, they will start to mobilize in more camps. So the dream is that in every camp there will be at least one active person so that can be can be uh, fought together. And what I think is, yeah, of course, you have to do it locally, like really is where you are, you have to fight against the system that concerns you. 
but there are more and more European things coming, like there are three new things, new hammers from the EU, for example, Eurosur or Eurosur or Eurosur, which means that there's even more military um, military defense of the European outside border. Like Frontex has already been reported to send uh, boats back where they have come from and also to make or that's to make them like fall. And then EuroDAC, this is the Euro Europe-wide uh, fingerprint database uh, which uh, allows to know if for example the guy has already been in Italy and then deported to Italy and this will be also um, get worse because there it will be I think it will be available for any police station or something like this. Like before it was just for special ones and now it's like everywhere you have access to it. And then there's one other thing that is a new law, European law to um, to arrest refugees. Six reasons I can just cite them. It's the reason why I think we should more and more connect all over Europe and exchange information. Like first reason is to assert identity. The second conservation of evidence. The third inquiry of right to immigrate. Uh, I mean that's what where they why they come here to us for asylum and say why they uh, are here. Fourth is too late application for asylum and it's the first time at least in Germany that prison is also used as an initiative for a disciplination. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, fifth is national security and order. And this is like the holistic thing with which you can uh, you can um, explain everything, do anything you want, and six is danger of submergence. And with this, you can really arrest any refugee at any time at any place, and even children. And uh, yeah, I wanted also to ask you how could uh, this look like to. Sometimes, I think, some, not all the time, not to make a big, uh, you know, big group who always works together, but sometimes exchange information uh, between several different European countries. Because uh, on this level, there, I think yeah, there is not enough room. Maybe we can talk this over coffee if you want. Because yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's just look at the uh, short video about oh, before that, uh, could you, Annie, just read again the AVI or what was it, this uh, anti and and the victims, because I didn't catch it on camera, I had to delay it. So.
Thank you.